I just finished reading the book Dark Persuasion by Joel E. Dimsdale. The full title of the book is Dark Persuasion, A History of Brainwashing from Pavlov to Social Media. So uh, the book in general is about the topic of persuasion and um, more specifically something that Dimsdale calls dark persuasion. So what is dark persuasion? Another term for dark persuasion is coercive uh, or forceful persuasion. And another more popular term maybe is brainwashing. So what I in general liked about uh, the book was um, it was very fact-oriented. It was very clear, it, the presentation, the writing style, um, very easy to follow. And I really liked Dimsdale attention to the historical detail and how he kind of the choices he made in bringing together a collection of facts, collection of stories, historical uh, accounts, events uh, from 20th century uh, and a little bit more recent, 21st century, connecting them together under the general topic of persuasion and dark persuasion. The book is quite disturbing. So it is a disturbing book, but I think it is quite useful uh, to read it. And I think it would benefit, we, we the readers, be, will, would benefit from a familiarity with this topic. So the uh, book, well, before getting into the detail about the book, let's, let's uh, talk about something that Dimsdale didn't really do as much or as effectively. When I read a book like this, I expect the author to provide a kind of conceptual framework. Because I have a kind of, a, my own thinking is philosophical, I want the author to say, this is how I think about persuasion. Uh, this is what I think persuasion means or can mean, different definitions of persuasion. And, you know, is there a, a bright persuasion or or humane persuasion and then contrasting that with dark persuasion. So my, let's add a little bit of that from my own thinking, uh, supplementing that to the material of the book. I think dark persuasion is a method or it consists of a set of methods that compromise a person's relationship with the truth. So that is, our, that is one of our initial assumptions, that human beings we all have, among all the different qualities and characteristics that we have, we have some kind of relationship with the truth or with truths, with the with reality. And brainwashing, dark persuasion, are methods, techniques, that want to compromise or cut that relationship, influence that relationship for some other purpose, for some political purpose, for some um, economic purpose, maybe they want they want us to, uh, to give our money to their charity or support their political agenda or give them information that we have and so forth. So I think that is quite important. Another way of describing dark persuasion is in terms of how it thinks about human beings. So there are multiple ways of thinking about human beings. One way is to think about human beings as possessors of uh, agency, that human beings are agents, they have sovereignty, they, they are capable of making decisions, they are capable of evaluating situations on their own. And if we emphasize those aspects of human being, then we will not want to force them. We will not want to, uh, if, we, if we respect the dignity of human beings, we will not enforce them into persuasion. So dark persuasion rests on the assumption that we can treat people as objects. So that's the, the other way, the other way of treating human beings, the other way of thinking about human beings, that humans are like machines. We can do things to them, to us. We can do things to our fellow human beings. And the things that we do have predictable consequences. So for example, if we put people in situations where they cannot get enough sleep, where they cannot get enough, uh, a rich enough, stimulating enough environment, information from environment, if they cannot communicate with the outside world, with other people, with a diverse group of people, people who disagree with them on some topics, if we cut uh, the person's connection with all those things, then maybe we can predictably say that they will believe the things we tell them. 
or maybe they will confess to the things that they know or they, uh, they reveal the secrets that they know. So that's a kind of the general approach that results in dark persuasion. It is an approach of, it's a, it's a way of thinking about human beings, not as humans, not as, not as agents, but as machines, as um, kind of mechanistic uh, collection of functions. Okay, so the book contains uh, many different historical threads, including the, the so-called show trials during the Stalin era in the Soviet Union, um, the interrogations of the prisoners of war during the Korean War, especially the uh, American prisoners, how they were interrogated uh, by the Chinese military. Um, and then after that, a whole bunch of research projects funded by the CIA, including that famous uh, MK Ultra, which you know they're very frequently uh, referenced in TV shows and movies. MK Ultra it was a real project, CIA-funded project that was interested in understanding uh, what brainwashing is, how brainwashing works, and how we can train people, brain maybe soldiers who are immune to brainwashing. And maybe one way of being immune is to delete, erase all the memories of our soldiers upon you know, demand. That's the, that's the sure way of um, having them incapable of revealing secrets. Uh, and as a result of that, that relationship between the CIA, the funding, and some scientists, there were some scientists with very questionable ethics, very loose and flexible, a moral code, including uh, a scientist named Ewan Cameron, work, who worked at, a, I think, a Canadian university. I think it was McGill for a while and was funded by the CIA and did a lot of damage to his patients. He was a psychiatrist. He did uh, electric shock therapy, and he was interested in uh, knowing when he can wipe out his patient's memory completely. And what he wanted to do was to say, okay, I, I don't have time to deal with the patient's past with all the problems that they, they carry from their childhood. I just want to clear their memory and, and work with a blank paper and, because then I can control what I put in there. If the, if the paper is blank, I can start more easily. Uh, so we had the, the Korean War, the show trials, the, the scientists, the CIA-funded projects, uh, other topics include the Stockholm Syndrome, the, the, ta the taking of hostages and how the hostage is kind of brainwashed, persuaded to, to like the, the captor, the person who's taking them hostage. The, um, um, even though that relationship is supposed to be a, a negative relationship full of tension and mistrust and anger, but the Stockholm Syndrome refers to the observation that that relationship is um, quite puzzling and confusing not as straightforward as we might expect. And finally, the, uh, the book talks about two uh, cults in the late 20th century American history. One of them was, ran, uh, was run by Jim Jones. It was called the People's Temple. The other one was Heaven's Gate. Uh, the People's Temple and Heaven's Gate both ended in the same way, and that was uh, the group suicide. The entire members, including the, the leaders, uh, killed themselves. As an act, as a final act of their uh, their faith, as act, as a final expression of their faith. So these are quite disturbing, all of them. Um, the last the last place the author leaves us is with a discussion of current neuroscientific methods that are quite powerful in influencing the way people think and feel. Um, it wasn't that long ago where um, who was that? A scientist who planted, uh, there was, uh, yeah, Dr. Robert G. Heath, who planted deep brain electrodes in the in human skull. And let's read a little bit. One of the cases that he worked on was a, was it, I think, 24-year-old homosexual man, and he, his intention was to convert him to heterosexuality. Uh, so uh, this is from page 219. Quote, in a notorious extension of this work, the deep brain electrode um, research, I guess, 
Heath used the self-stimulating paradigm on patient B19, a 24-year-old homosexual man with temporal lobe epilepsy, drug addiction, and depression. The goal was to convert him to heter heterosexuality. After recovering from surgery, the patient learned that if he presses the button, he would experience feelings of sexual pleasure, so much so that he pressed the button as often as 1,500 times during three hours, during a three-hour period, and uh, pro protested when the device was taken away from him. Uh, skipping a little bit ahead, uh, we read, at one point, the CIA approached Heath asking if he would work with the agency to study the brain's pleasure and pain system. Heath spurned the invitation and said, disgusting. If I wanted to be a spy, I would have been a spy. I wanted to be a doctor and practice medicine. There is there's a lot to say about uh, the, the book. The last thing I want to focus on is the role of the Russian scientist Ivan Pavlov. And Dimsdale says that throughout this entire project, throughout the whole time that he was writing this book, everything that he paid attention to was kind of the, the shadow of Pavlov was cast on it, all the material. So why Pavlov? who is in psychology, psychological science. Pavlov is known for his classical conditioning, training dogs to expect uh, certain outcomes when the sound or light, uh, when they see or hear something, they expect something. So the so-called contingencies that he taught to animals. They have, those have applications, but it is not as clear why uh, and why that has to do with, why that is so deeply related to brainwashing. So the reason is this. The reason is that those designs of the environment that Pavlov did for the dogs, they are not just isolated events, the isolated associations. They have to do with designing and manipulating the animal's view of the world. The dog doesn't say, oh, the scientist is giving me food when, whenever he rings the bell. The dog enters into a world in which, in that, in that world, that is a rule. So that is a way in which the world operates for the dog. So similarly, in an interrogation setting, when there is a prisoner who is being interrogated, using the Pav Pavlovian principles, the interrogator will say, uh, implicitly, using actions and you know, contingencies, that your well-being is in my hand. If I decide, you can sleep. If I decide, you can have a meal. That's why the interrogators usually begin very negatively, very aggressively, but also occasionally they demonstrate to the prisoner, to the person being interrogated, that if I want, I will make sure that you can have a good time. If I want, you can uh, be comfortable. So that's kind of the world. The, that's a, a, a very, it's a big way to, as I said before, that, that phrase, to sever the relationship between the person and reality to compromise their relationship to the truth. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. The book is, um, the book would be useful uh, if you have interest in human thought, the influence of um, persuasion, coercive persuasion, and how, uh, you know, they're one of the possible branches to go on. Um, I might do that in the future is to talk about how a very strict, dogmatic, scientific worldview, a very materialistic worldview, actually makes people vulnerable to a particular kind of brainwashing. If you're interested in that, I would recommend reading uh, Somerset Mom's short book a novel, The Magician. In that book, we read about the story of a, a man who thinks, who really looks down on all kinds of superstition, and he's very like a scientist. I only believe in facts, things that I can see with my senses. And we see how that kind of inflexibility, that kind of not having a relationship with one's own unconscious, with the things that seem mysterious, how if we completely cut ties with that side of life, we actually become extremely vulnerable to cult leaders who come in and present that mysterious world to us and we are unprepared and we would be um, vulnerable to capture by, by them and the, the way they weaponize the mysteries of life to, to employ 
dark persuasion. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I will, if you have any questions about the book, if you want me to say more things about the book, about the topic, uh, let me know. Feel free to, to comment and ask questions. <laughs> ask questions. Otherwise, I'll speak with you in future videos.